My recent video on the XP47J threw up a couple of controversies in the comments section. One was the outrage amongst those that insist that the DO-335 was the fastest piston engine fighter of the Second World War. I'll say this again, it wasn't. But the other, and surprisingly even more vocal section was over my saying this. If the big juggernaut, or jug as it was affectionately nicknamed, and this caused a lot of you good folks, mainly American, to get very insistent that the nickname in fact came about because, duh, the P-47 looked like a traditional milk jug. But the row got me thinking, just what is the origin of the P-47's jug nickname? The answer is rather opaque, and to be honest, now it would probably be impossible to absolutely confirm the original meaning of the nickname. But as it is apparently a subject of some interest, and indeed vitriol, that makes it worth taking a look at. Plus, there is another answer that doesn't generally make it into the history books, but which I think might be correct. As said, for Americans, the name derives from the fact that the P-47 has a profile when on its nose, similar to a contemporary milk jug of the time. Pretty straightforward. Indeed, there is a quote from famed pilot James Goodson, who described the P-47 as seven-ton milk bottles. But I think there is more to that description than at first meets the eye, and I'll come back to that later. As for the Jug for Juggernaut nickname, that has appeared in British publications on the aircraft for many years now, which explains why I thought it was the accepted definition. And as a nickname for the P-47, it would certainly be apt. The English term Juggernaut originates from a Hindu tradition where huge carts were built for important festivals and then dragged through the streets. European witnesses to these events reported that it was far from unusual for festival participants to get crushed under these massive vehicles, as when they started rolling, they were so heavy that almost nothing could stop their inevitable progress. Hence, we now have in modern English the term juggernaut for a large articulated truck, but also as a figurative word to describe an unstoppable force. And the P-47 basically fits both of those descriptions. The Thunderbolt, to give it its official service name, was truly massive for a Second World War fighter, dwarfing just about every other single-engine aircraft of similar type. For perspective, the P-40E Warhawk, an aircraft the P-47 largely replaced in service, was 31 feet 8.5 inches in length, had a wingspan of 37 feet 3.5 inches, and an empty weight of 5,922 pounds. The British Spitfire Mark 5B, again an aircraft a little earlier than the Jug, but broadly of the same age, came in with a length of 29 feet 11 inches, wingspan of 36 feet 10 inches, and an empty weight of 5,065 pounds. The FW190A3, one of the P-47's principal opponents over Europe, as well as another radial engine aircraft like the Thunderbolt, length 28 feet 10 inches, wingspan 34 feet 5 inches, and an empty weight of 6,393 pounds. The P-47D, by contrast. 36 feet 1 and 3 quarter inches long by 40 feet 9 and 5 sixteenths inches wide and weighing 10,000 pounds empty. You can see why some pilots joked that if they got attacked while flying the jug, they could save themselves by running around inside the fuselage until they found somewhere to hide. But this sheer size and weight meant that the P-47 well fit the description of an unstoppable force as it could outdive anything out there at the time. Combine that with a heavy armament of eight 50 caliber Browning heavy machine guns and an ability to just suck up ridiculous amounts of damage and keep flying, well, the juggernaut description seems more than apt. So it is understandable to see why some folks thought that that was the meaning of the jug nickname. Certainly, aviation writer Sam McGowan states that that is the correct explanation. But which is right? To be honest, trying to figure out which was correct was going to be nigh on impossible. At first, I thought the way might be to try and find the earliest reference to both nicknames in printed publications, with whichever came first being the right explanation. But that would probably be impossible without huge amounts of effort. Besides, as the pilots named the aircraft, it would probably be better to go through pilots' journals and squadron records to see where the first reference to the name is to be found. 
But again, that would be a huge effort and, quite frankly, far more research than would really be justified for what is, after all, a niche talking point. The whole thing for me became more of a mental exercise on how you would go about trying to research something like this rather than an actual reality. And while mulling it over, I mentioned the whole topic to JD at the Dinga Aviation website. Long-time viewers of the channel might recall that name as I have collaborated with JD in the past and drawn on his research on several of my videos. If you don't know about Dinga Aviation, I will link to it in the description. Very much a place for you if you like odd aircraft and aviation musings. But to get to the point, JD said research wasn't necessary, as he already knew the answer. Apparently the issue was one of some discussion in the letters columns of various British aviation magazines in the 1970s and 80s. Of course, back then, there were still plenty of pilots and ground crew around who remembered the origin of the nickname and were able to explain it. Because also bear in mind, though the term Jug is now largely synonymous with the P-47, for many of those who served on the aircraft, that was not a known nickname, and in fact there were several others that were applied to the aircraft. But the Jug name apparently originated in the earliest days of it entering service with the United States Army Air Force in England, and is, according to JD, a crude and roundabout pun. Sorry if you are squeamish about such things, but I am now going to talk about a range of bodily functions. In Britain, to thunder is a euphemism for passing gas, or farting to be blunt. The expression's usage has declined somewhat in recent times, but during World War II it was a common expression. From this the British got the term thunderbox, which originally was the sort of outdoor toilet that was standard for most houses prior to the war, and which would often be a small shed, with the toilet being a wooden box with a circular hole cut in it. Having used outhouses of this very same design in various parts of the world, I can indeed confirm that they do indeed enhance your personal thunder. The use of the term thunderbox was also applied to small portable toilets, equivalent to the American term porta potty, but also as reference to the small toilets that were fitted in large military aircraft that engaged in long endurance missions. It was also a vernacular name for a chamber pot, a receptacle that people would take to bed with them and, if they had need during the night, would allow them to avoid making a potentially freezing cold and damp trek up the end of the garden to use the bathroom. And this in turn led to the creation of another vernacular term, the thunder jug. This was a utensil which a man could use to urinate in, thus avoiding a similar need to go outside on a cold night. And said utensil was often a jug, or a milk bottle. Starting to see the connection, right? Aircrew in the UK during the war were often housed in basic Nissan huts or tents, and their ablution blocks, which housed their communal toilets, were separate structures. Thus, the use of thunder jugs was practically a standard with personnel who would not want to stray too far from their warm bed, especially if it meant wandering in the freezing cold rain across a blacked out muddy airfield to a toilet tent or shack that probably wasn't very pleasant in the first place. And no doubt, American personnel came across the term thunderbox while serving with British personnel, especially those that had volunteered to serve in the Royal Air Force before the United States entered the war. Pilots such as James Goodson, who served in the RAF Eagle Squadrons before transferring to the US AAF. The veneration that the P-47 is now held in often overlooks the fact that pilots initially were extremely dubious of the aircraft, it being impossible to imagine that the monster would ever be an effective fighter when compared to the much smaller standards of its contemporaries. And most vocal of these critics were the 4th Fighter Group, which was formed from the three former Eagle Squadrons. Indeed, Goodson freely admitted that he was not at all happy about being forced to give up his slim and elegant Spitfire for the hulking Thunderbolt, hence his later comment about it being a 7 ton milk bottle. But considering the likely usage that Goodson had been employing milk bottles for, I must wonder if he was being polite in his book by not referring to the real meaning for the nickname, a 7 ton piss pot. Goodson would come to greatly admire the P 47, but I suspect by then the name, granted by the thoroughly annoyed pilots of the 4th Fighter Group, had stuck. 
So in conclusion, we have an aircraft that has the term Thunder in its name already, looks a bit like a milk bottle, apparently, from a certain angle, and which really wasn't popular with its first users, who had been exposed in turn to a particular form of vernacular language. The juggernaut nickname seems to have originated, according to JD, from British aviation publications in the 1960s as an explanation for the jug name, something that lines up with the thinking of one American commentator I read on an online forum who reckoned that this was the British giving his fellow countrymen far too much literary credit. Now I must add a proviso to this video. While JD recalls the details of this distant discussion very well, he admits that, despite searching his archives, he hasn't been able to locate the actual magazines that hold the evidence. So we have to rank this bit of history as unsourced and unverified at this time. But it would, considering the mentality of military personnel throughout the ages and their pretty much universal fixation with toilet humour, make for a perfectly feasible explanation. If anyone has any additional information, either backing this up or otherwise countering it, feel free to post it in the comments. And I have to say thanks to JD for amusing me greatly with all the details. Share, like, subscribe, all that jazz, and have a good one, folks.